we are struggling with something, they, there's this peace that comes from knowing we can ask for our brothers and sisters to pray with us and for us. And God hears and God does. This is some of the most powerful stuff, I think, that the book of Matthew uh, has recorded. Uh, particularly uh, timely was the fact that this past Thursday, we were able to gather out here in the front of the building uh, with our partner, Bob Gartner, and his group from Messengers of Hope Mission and we were able to have a food pantry. And just as we wrapped up chapter 25 uh, of Matthew, there's some passages in there in 25 that talks about what? The least of these. When you take care of, of one person who's needing something, uh, and they, they it says, I'll tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will return to those on the left and say, away with you, you cursed ones, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick and or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous and will go into eternal life. Folks, we had a great blessing on Thursday yes. because there were people that drove by and saw food pantry free food and they knew they were able to come in and they did and we had some that were saying well it wasn't but a few well it only takes one right and fortunately there were more that came and those that came were blessed not only by food but we had prepared these blessing bags with things in there and for those of you in this audience who were there and helped uh, in the month of April on the last, third Thursday we'll do it again so if you want to help the least of these uh, please come on out and, and enjoy not only the joy it brings to see a smile on someone's face who's getting these things, but also the joy of fellowship from each other. That was one of the unsung blessings. And if you had seen some of the flag people that we had out there waving these orange flags, hailing people to come in, it just made it that more joyous. Let's go to God. Lord, we are blessed because you are our Savior and we are in your house. Thank you for the friends and the fellowship that goes on here. We praise you, God, for giving us your son, Jesus. We praise you for making all things possible for one reason, and that is so that we have an opportunity for a home in heaven with you and we can bring joy on our journey here on this earth despite all the stuff that's going on around us. God, we have you, and we know that you will not fail us. Thank you, God, for being our Savior. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, and the whole class said, amen. amen. This morning, in, in wrapping up uh, 26, 27, 28, we're going to be looking specifically at uh, Jesus' last few uh, days on the earth. And we're going to reflect on some of the, the big pieces of information that are recorded in these chapters. I do want you to realize that today uh, we've got Bob Ray carrying the microphone for a real reason. This is not a lectureship in Chemistry 101. This is your participation day. 
because on your tip sheet, uh, we have a series of questions from each one of the chapters. I have taken the liberty, in case you have sort of a slow approach to answers, I took the liberty to just sort of write down from previous classes that I've had with this, uh, particularly with a bunch of college kids that I was mentoring one summer, uh, some of their answers and my answers are blended on your tip sheet. But as we go through the morning and the questions pop up, I ask you to please feel free to participate and it's okay if you read some of the answers and it triggers you with some of the thoughts that you may have please join in because this is a wrap-up session and it's your turn and your joy uh, to share. So please uh, help me do that. Uh, we're talking truly from the 26th chapter about his, Jesus being uh, sprayed with this expensive perfume, anointed with the perfume, how he was betrayed by Judas, uh, conducted the Last Supper, and the prayer of Gethsemane. We're going to spend some time on that, and then we're going to go into chapter 27, where we talked about something I know y'all have heard about, Potter's Field, a.k.a. Murder Meadow. You ever wonder why it's picked up that name? We talk about Pilate, and, and you know this guy Barabbas? You've, you've all read about him. Uh, the crucifixion of Christ, how the tomb was sealed and guarded, and then, as I mentioned when we first got together, my very first and, and most exciting lesson in the whole book of Matthew is off of the chapter 28, 18 through 20, uh, and, and the verses. Uh, 28, 19 is a vanguard mission statement for all of us, and we'll be talking about this great commission we got some goals that we want to achieve for each chapter. Uh, 26, I want you to pick up on how the significance of Jesus' sacrificial death uh, was how he was obedient to his Father's will. And to see and to challenge you that it inspires each of us to a deeper commitment to follow Christ. Over in 27... We're going to talk, as Jan mentioned, and I, I don't know, do you have a communion for a second service? Pay attention this morning to what Jan's remarks are about communion service. Uh, it fits just wonderfully with chapter 27 where we talk about Jesus suffering on the cross and what that looked like and how the people reacted around that cross. But for the reason that it was the ultimate victory over sin and death. That event should lead us to understand more than ever before the love of God and the assurance that we have through Christ. And then we'll wrap up with the Great Commission, and I'm going to challenge all of us to remember this is not just words out of the book. This is a mandate. This is an incentivizer for us to go, to baptize, to teach, and to bring people on the journey with Christ. All about following that mandate. And as you do that, how it will excite you and help you get through this tough world that we live in. So those are the three brief goals that we want to do. And at this time, I want us to go to the Heavenly Father in prayer. Once again, God, we take this prayer time and we come to you asking you for your guidance. I pray that you would bless me this morning as I seek to share from my heart your words and the importance of some of these goals that we've set through you and the spirit leading me i ask god that you would bless me in trying to carry the message as always i plead with you to make your word be the source of inspiration 
to each of us. Father, may we do this well. May we use the talents that you've given us to help grow, to seek, to spread the word, and to love you more. I pray this again in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, we're in 26. The highlight of most of the commentaries in 26 talk about how these multiple actions are going on. One is over in Bethany, and one is at a guy's house named Cephas. We got some priests and some elders all gathered together in a house, and they are having a sidebar discussion about what? How to capture and kill this guy, Jesus Christ. And meanwhile, over in Bethany, there's a fellow who was a, a former leper. His name is what? Simon. There's a meal going on between the disciples and Jesus in chapter 26. And then what happens? There's this woman that shows up with this expensive perfume. And she anoints Jesus with the perfume. And as usual, just like some of us would do, what did the disciples do? What did they do? They, it. they, it's like, what are you doing? You're wasting something so expensive that would, would have fed the poor. Isn't that sound just like us? You know, it's like, how dare you spend that money on, on such a thing? You could have taken it somewhere else. I call that shoulda, woulda, coulda. And it's just amazing how natural the disciples are reacting. And for those of you who have seen The Chosen, the thing that popped into my mind was how these guys, they're so human that they would make such a statement. Okay? But what did God do? Jesus said, why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing? You'll always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. Tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Bingo. And look at this. Thousands of years later, 2,000 plus, what are we doing? We're talking about the act of this woman. That is a significant emotional event for me that says, and it's for you too, it says, let's not be criticizing people who are trying to help. Okay? This is one of those things where, all right, what happens sometime later? Here comes our guy Judas. What's he doing? He's making a deal. Now, Judas, why do you think he did that? Why would Judas want to make a deal to betray God? We got an answer right up here. Power on the mic, the handheld, please. I, I just find it very interesting after seeing The Chosen and then reading this, the order that it happens in. You know, here, all the disciples are saying, why couldn't we just sell it and have the money? And then all of a sudden, here's Judas. He goes and gets more money. What can I do? And, and, and all along we've been hearing he's been taking money out of the bag. So maybe this was sort of like one of those things where this is the, the straw that breaks the camel's back. Judas just like, gotcha. okay, Jesus, if it's all about you, then, then this is not right. You know, we don't know how, how he felt and what brought him to that. Yeah, yeah. we but don't know. We know that money was his, was his nemesis. Yep. Go. And the scripture gives us the answer as to the why. And Satan 
entered him. Satan entered him. That's the why he did it. Mm -hmm. Do you think Satan was plotting all along that he's sort of the weak link? Oh, no. He, he left all of that alone. <laughs> it's just been intriguing to me as to why Judas? And I think Kathy hit it. You nailed it. Satan entered. That's why. And, that, and we just leave it there. So what's the lesson for us on, on the Judas behavior? For the prince of the air is out there. That's right. With us today. That's it. We are susceptible today. That's it. But if you resist, the devil will flee. And that's the tough part, is starting the resistance. Yes, sir. Mike, coming up. I'm not Mike. I'm Loopy. <laughs> it says, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Yep. Say it again. It says, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Submit. We have to be, keep the armor of God on at all times because the devil is out there roaring. Yep. Amen. 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 So we have coming up next, the Last Supper, the Passover. You know, the disciples are all, they're logistically focused. What's going to, where are we going, where do you want the meal? Da, 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 da. And then Jesus, as not expected, he comes in and he relays the message. One of you are going to betray me. And everybody starts the self-defense thing. Oh, is it me? Is it me? I wouldn't do that. And yet, Jesus knows one of them will. And then he even goes so far as to predict that Peter is going to deny him. And you know Peter, he's my kind of guy. Oh, no way. That's not going to be me. Be careful, church. The minute that you start talking about, it can't be me. I'm not going to betray. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to commit sin. Boom. It hits you. That's the deal about Peter. He was one of the best, right? And yet, he got scared, feared what could happen to him, and went the other way. And then the highlight in a lot of the commentaries is the prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane. And Again, I go to the natural occurrence of the disciples. Come with me, pray. By the way, wait here while I go into the garden and pray. Going, going back to the fear part, isn't, okay. isn't that where, the, where it begins? The evil part begins is in your mind when you're fearful, you're weak. And that's where the devil gets you. The minute that you stop looking at the strength of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father, and you get fearful, here comes the devil. Excellent point, excellent point. Jesus said, you guys wait here. He went on a little further and he bowed with his face to the ground praying, my father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me, yet I want your will to be done. Comes out, finds what? All the disciples asleep. Then he said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Jesus left a second time, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, you'll be, your will be done. He returned in verse 43 again, and he found them yet asleep, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things. Then he came to the disciples and said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayal is here. 
So over to you. What aspect of Jesus' prayer in the garden resonates with you the most? Erica's got one and then Jan. Well, I was just going to say most of my prayers are always um, asking God to please let this pass. Ah, okay. Because <laughs> I don't want to suffer. Okay. Very rarely do I say, you know, thy will be done. You know, if I'm being honest with myself, when I'm facing ad um, adversity, it's not a pleasant feeling. So I'm always, you know, asking God, please, you know, let me get past this, let me get through this, or remove this from me. Um, because some, you know, I don't think I'm strong enough to endure it to the end sometimes. I love it. What that signals to me, sister, is that you recognize that there's power. There's prayer, power, and God will not fail. It may not be on your or my timeline, but he hears and he will take care, right? Jan. You may find this a little hard to believe, but I've got a somewhat different take okay, than what on we me. have traditionally Listen heard. Listen up for a different take. You know, we t typically hear that Jesus didn't want to suffer the pain of crucifixion. Now, he was man enough not to be looking forward to it. He didn't, he didn't get up that morning and say, oh, yay, I get to be nailed and beaten and, and all that kind of stuff. I think it went deeper than that. When you layer 2 Corinthians 5.21 that says, he who knew no sin, he made him to be sin in our behalf uh. that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then you pull from the Old Testament for sin your sin has separated between you and God. I think the cup that Jesus was dreading the most was that for those six hours, as he became our sin, he suffered for the first time in his existence, separation from the Father. Separation from the Father. Amen. That's a great And take. that's what he dreaded. I think so, too. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Look at this one. Reflecting on Jesus' prayer, how do you personally get through the moments of surrender and trust in God's plan during the challenging times? How do you get through it? Lupe. Be still and know that I am God. Whoa, be still and know that I am God. So that's the first thing you do is you go to him first. I go to him first. Okay. No matter what the situation is or how it feels or how it looks. Beautiful. And then tag along for that. Tag along up here. We're being still. We're knowing God is God. And? And even if others, your closest friends, can't come and support you, you still stay with God. Because he is God. Job. Just as Job. Job's friends. Okay. All right. I've heard. Be still. Seek God. Remain close. You got community. You got friends. What else? Anything else? Yes. Carla? I always have a take of, at the end of the day, what's meant to be will be, because God has it set for me. Whoa. So even going through hard times, even praying for an outcome that is pleasing to me, I pray first for an outcome that God intends. And you learn from good, bad, and indifferent. You learn a lesson. There's something to take away. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? RJ's got one here, Bob. I appreciate y'all participating like this. This is awesome stuff. When you're asking for these prayers, you got to remember the patience you got to have with God because we're not Ooh. on his time. Like, I mean, we're on his time. He's not on our time. Oh, See, that, that, that's what you really got to remember is to be patient. Amen. I want it now, God. God. Right? <laughs> Hurry up. What's going on here? Carla nailed it with the faith. We, we nailed it with, we got to surrender. It's not on our time. That's how we navigate through this. I love the fact that we got each other. This church is phenomenal 
about praying for each other. If we are struggling with something, they, there's this peace that comes from knowing we can ask for our brothers and sisters to pray with us and for us. And God hears and God does. Okay? Last one on 26. How does this Jesus example of surrendering to God's will in the face of adversity inspire your own life circumstances? How are you inspired? I think, first of all, you have to humble yourself. Whew. There's so many people that are hurting, even here in this congregation, that are afraid to step forward and ask for prayer because they're either ashamed or afraid, whatever it is, it's the devil holding the them devil. back. And if you ask for prayer, prayer is powerful. It is. I'm testimony here. I, I was suffering during the week. And I asked for prayer, and lo and behold, here I am. Wonderful comment. Thank you, sister. Anybody else? I see this opportunity of Jesus' example during our adversity. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me this unbelievable foundation of hope and endurance to go forward it just speaks to what you talked about that in the times of adversity i know that through my god and my family i have hope and that's pretty cool stuff it works okay all right we got peter denying jesus tell us about a time where fear or pressure led you to compromise your faith or values? How did you navigate and what lessons did you learn? That's a tough one. I think you all are not answering that one because, because you, while you're thinking, uh, I summarize for you the really challenging thing in my whole career at the Washington Metro system. I was the lead dude. I was the head honcho on all of the contracts that we wrote and the billions of dollars that my group spent. And trains and buses are one of the most important things about a metro system. If the metro trains are broken down, you can't put full capacity on a seven car train, okay? And you got buses that parts aren't being delivered and the buses are in the shop more than they're on the road. Well, what that does, it impacts revenue string and when the metro loses money, that's not a really good thing. I was an advocate for competition in contracting, okay? And yet, when I went to Metro, there was a belief that everything had to be sole source. And for those of you who've ever been around contracting, I'm sure John Wharton understands very well that lots of things need to be sole source. There's two reasons. One, you got a valid supplier. You're not so sure that the price is most reasonable, but at least it gets there and you don't mind spending a few dollars more. Well, in Metro, 96% of all the repair parts were sole source. Well, we're spending government money. And when you're spending government money, the goal is about 35% of the government money needs to be competed so that you know you're getting the best value, etc. Well, I compromised my values. I compromised my Christian beliefs because I was afraid that my whole group 
would be failures to provide repair parts on time. And oh, by the way, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you, I was afraid I'd get fired. Because when you got all these big wigs over there, and for years and years, at least seven years before I got there, over 90% was sole source. Well, I come rolling in and I talk about this word competition, and you would have thought I had condemned everybody to the devil. And I was advised, don't do that. And I rationalized out of fear, Loopy, that, well, maybe I just shouldn't rock the boat. And for about two more years, I didn't rock the boat. And then it just kept gnawing on me, Kathy, that I'm probably losing my values as a Christian because I am going along with all this. And by the way, I knew that there were other sources out there that could provide these parts, although it would take a little bit longer, and when I say longer, maybe a month longer, but the price would most likely be a lower price for the same level of quality. Bottom line is, I finally stood up to what my belief taught me to do. It took two years too long. And 12 months later, I was fired, along with four other people. The finance guy, logistics guy, supply guy, and the procurement guy. But God took care of me because he gave me a six-month parachute to find something else to do. Bottom line, I compromised over something out of fear. And I hope that you don't compromise your belief in what you know to be right over something because you let the devil get inside. You with me? Amen. All right. What lessons did I learn? I put them on the sheet. Integrity is the number one thing. <clears throat> Courage to stand firm. Trust that God's got you. And that's why you hear me literally live by God's got this. Because I saw him take care of me when I did not honor him with my belief, my actions. And he forgave me for making that mistake. Those are the lessons that I learned. Anybody else on that? Yes, sir, help me. Thanks for listening to my story, by the way. Did you? I think it's important when we're reading essentially about the failure of Peter in Matthew 26 and his denial, we should always accompany that scripture with um, Acts 4. Here we have him in a denying Jesus because of the fear of a slave girl, the fear of the persecution of the, because I believe he was at the um, high priest's house, Caiaphas's house at that time. But in Acts 4, the very same Peter who was afraid of the slave girl, was able to stand before that very same Sahedrin and profess Christ and confess Christ in front of him. So I think it's essential that when we do fail, that we always realize that though we were Matthew 26, we can also be Acts 4 as well. Way to go, brother. Everybody make that connection? I would put it in my margin right there. See Acts, Acts 4. Well done. All right, any other comments on 26? Kim's up here, Bob. By the way, everybody say hello to the lady from Honey Grove, Texas, Miss Kim Susong. And there's some folks out here who actually know where Honey Grove is. So, I have a shirt that has the question on it. <laughs> you know, I think it even comes down to more practicality than that. Okay. Everyday things like sometimes we're afraid to even talk about our faith ah. because of all the persecution out there and and how about when we don't stand up about things that are and I'm I I rather than rock the boat don't say anything I just don't participate I don't you know how about abortion you know how about all the sexual immorality and the things we're supposed to accept now absolutely and we're quiet because 
We don't want to be judged. Or we're told you're not supposed to judge. How about granddaughters who say, when you want to correct them, maybe in their dress or their, you know, don't judge me. That's what they're being taught. Don't judge me. Judge you. Amen. You know, even God wants me to teach you. I'm your grandmother. So, I mean, things is, those are, these are even everyday things that we don't. Yep. Everybody got that? We're, we're, the, we're wishy-washy. We're quiet. Look at the everyday things. Don't be wishy-washy. I don't mean go out there and beat a drum and, you know, it's just, uh, I think a lot of times we're just afraid to even say what our position is. We let it go. Yep. That's well how, said. And that's how they progress into really bad things. That's Thank you, sister. Smart stuff coming from Honey Grove. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Okay. 27. It's all about the crucifixion. It's all about the suffering. It's all about the bloodshed, the harassment, the ridicule, everything that our Lord went through. When you read 27, and I know everyone in here has read the account of the crucifixion, Share with me some emotions that you feel within you as you think about and reflect on Jesus' crucifixion. How did his sacrifice impact your understanding of God's love? What do you feel when you read about the crucifixion? Jan. In 1963, I became aware of a book um, by Jim Bishop called The Day Christ Died. And that began for me, well, however many years it is now past 63, a study of all things crucifixion. In my library at home, I have a four-inch binder of my research and results and things like that. Wow. Uh, in my communion thoughts, you'll hear some of my reaction. Yeah. But the thing that jumps out of my research at me is one clinical pathologist. Most clinical pathologists say that if they were going to issue a uh, reason for death, a cause of death, it would be um, exhaustive asphyxiation. The, the way crucifixion was designed, a guy basically worked himself to death where he could not breathe anymore. There's one pathologist who adds to that cardiac rupture. Ooh. Jesus' heart literally broke on the cross. That just goes to my gut. Grabs you. Thank you. Wow. Anybody else? I was in a communion service over in the Dominican, and the fellow that was leading the service read about the crucifixion. And he had a block of wood. It was about a four by four, about three feet long. And he brought the block of wood up and it was a wooden stage that he was on. And then when he was addressing the crucifixion, he painted the picture of Christ nailed to the cross, the hands through the feet, and about how that pain and agony was. But then he remarked about he was hanged but he was nailed while the cross was not standing. He was nailed to the cross. And then the cross was lifted up and it was thrust into this hole. That's his version of how it went. But when he told the story about the cross being thrust into the open hole, he slammed this four by four onto the wooden stage and it just shook 
and reverberated across. And the thought of that and the agony that must have gone with our Savior on that dying that he did, it brought me to realize the magnitude of the death. And then it brought me to the reality about what was happening by my Savior because of that act. That's the emotion that brought sorrow first, but then it brought me to reflect on the why. And I hope you do the same thing, that you are remembering why. And I just love when people talk and jeer a little bit about that church of yours Y'all take that Lord's Supper every Sunday. And I say, amen, we do. Because it recreates what my Savior did for me. And I'm so glad we do it frequently. That's the emotion it draws with me. Anyone else on that one? Kathy's got one. And we have, go ahead. Yes, sir. Speaking of the asphyxiation, yes. you know, crucifixion wasn't an inactive torture. It was an active. You had to participate in it. And the way the blocks were set up and the way their bodies was, the way the Romans constructed it, your body would hang down and you would begin to suffocate. In order for you to get relief, you had to push yourself up from the block by pushing your feet into the spikes in your feet. And then you had to raise yourself up until you got enough air and then you would drop back down, back into that normal position. What strikes me about this is all throughout the Gospels is Jesus is doing this over and over and over again. And while he's doing this, he's still providing. He's still giving salvation to that other criminal on the cross next to him. He's still telling Mary, this is your new mother, John. This is your mother. And he's still blessing. He's still forgiving even though he's fighting through this excruciating pain, even though the sin is being poured all throughout him for those hours and that separation that he's experiencing from God, he's still providing salvation for all these people around him. I love it. Way to go, brother. I ask you, after you listen to the communion thoughts this morning, just take some time this afternoon to go into 27 and read it again. I think that it will do for you uh, the joy bringer. I want to move into 28 while we still have a few minutes if we could okay. and think about the Great Commission and what does it mean to you personally to be called to make disciples of all nations? How do you try to actively live this out? And the bottom line is that in 2819 Jesus tells us Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all commands I've given you. Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We have a mission in 2819, I think, that is maybe secondary to love God and, and love others. I believe that the go and the teach and the baptize and to be with and study, I think that's what makes us who we are as Christ followers. And what's happening in this congregation is that each one of us has the talent to do that and you are doing it in a different way each one of us are doing it some are encouraging some are in your face talking it some are exampling it and guess what that's what the whole mandate is about do what you can with the talents that God's given you I got one on the back with Monty Betts Last Thursday, we had a group of folks in this congregation that came together 
and in a systematic way provided food and, and things that were needed by others. And the people that came and received the food and the other items that we gave them seemed to be truly happy to get that. Uh, I noticed among the line of workers, everybody was happy to be able to do that. There was a joy that I saw among our folks as they were interacting with the individuals that were there and they were adults and they were little kids and everything in between. But uh, I think that was part of the Great Commission. And the people didn't say, why are you doing this or whatever? But I think it was evident you came out on a Thursday, you made preparations and you shared with these people in the name of God. Amen. And the result of all that is icing on the cake because relationships were built. Relationships were either started or they were cultivated. Not only amongst the folks that walked through the line, but amongst our fellow workers here, there are people that served together that had never been together before. And with that, that's part of the Great Commission that we are mandated to do. Amen? Amen. Folks, it's a joy. Thank you for being with us this morning.